In this session we're going to look at Porter's Five Forces. Uh, we've already produced uh, a series of classes on each of the, the forces and in this particular one we're going to look at competitive rivalry. This is really economics but uh, since we'll be dealing with economics uh, with separate sessions and just to give it a different slant I'm going to try and deal with competitive rivalry without the terminology of economics. So we're just going to sidestep economics. In fact, when you do economics, you'll realize I haven't sidestepped it at all. I'm just using different different words. But nonetheless, let's go through it in a, in a non-economic terminological way. So let's, let's sidestep it that way. Um, competitive rivalry between existing players is where we start. I say players. Players means companies, existing companies or existing uh, participants in the market. And we start with the idea that competitive rivals are organizations with similar products and services aimed at the same group of consumers. Uh, it's a pretty good definition, really, of, of what happens in, in economics. Um, if we can go back there for a second. It's this idea that competition exists when companies have similar products so they're trying to dispose of the similar products or services and they're really aimed at the same market so the competition exists between the firms to try and uh, produce market sell generate profits from the same set of or a similar set of products aimed at the same set of consumers so hence the competitive element the reason why they do this is of course because they want greater market share. The companies are in business to make a profit. They're in business to survive. They're in business to um, generate surpluses that they can reinvest and grow the business. So they want to try and meet their corporate objectives. And to do, the, the, to do this they have to beat their competitors. High competitive pressure results in lower prices. The more competitors selling in the market, the, the lower the price. So the consumer benefits, but the companies have to suffer lower prices. And that means they suffer lower profit margins and lower profitability overall. As consumers, we like this. We like the idea of having cheap products and cheap goods. Um, but of course the companies who have suffered as a consequence may not now be able to invest in the business and of course long run <coughs> employment within that sector may fall. Rivalry occurs because uh, one or more of the competitors either feels the pressure or sees the opportunity to see to improve uh, its position. Um, that is a good statement of entrepreneurship. It's the entrepreneur, the business person, sees an opportunity and thereby tries to meet that opportunity, try to fulfill the opportunity by uh, taking on directly the competitors and producing different products. One way of competing is to, <coughs> excuse me, by lowering or by raising the price to gain a temporary advantage. Uh, that's under the control of the business. The business may determine what the price is. Um, but constant lowering and raising of prices may be uh, counterproductive, as we'll see later on. I'll mention this in a, a later slide. Another way of competing is, is by using the distribution channels more effectively. For example, uh, perhaps selling uh, in DIY stores if it's a household product or it could sell in a supermarket or it could sell even online. So creative use of distribution channels is another way of competing. Of course the <coughs> excuse me the the company could um, improve the quality of the good make it more contemporary more make it more attractive in the marketplace, change the design, change the texture, change the functionality of the product. And perhaps by changing the quality and, and changing the perception of the quality of the product, 
greater branding will, will occur as a, as a consequence and the product will be differentiated, at least in the mind of the consumer. And that's another way of competing. <coughs> me. Price changes. Well, when we think of price changes, we have to think of elasticity of demand. Elasticity of demand is a separate topic in economics and we dealt with separately. But for the moment, it's simply the responsiveness of demand to a change in price. That's all elasticity is. So if the price goes up, by what percentage will the, the demand fall as a consequence? So elasticity of demand considerations are very very important. It's not just a question of varying the price and keeping your fingers crossed. You've got to have some idea about how consumers are going to react to the price change. Constant price changing may uh, alienate the consumer. Consumers have built up knowledge of the market through experience by shopping. And through shopping they have built up pictures, pictures of what products and what the the prices of those products. They've got these pictures in their mind when they when they set out to shop. And if every time you go shopping the, the prices have changed, you are wrecking or the company is wrecking that knowledge. And that can be disorientating. It, it can be people have to shop around again and even though they they're going to buy the product and uh they they settled on the product they got it in their basket in their minds they're probably thinking i wonder what is the price down the road so am i being shortchanged or am i being cheated in some way so the the market is being destroyed or is is being disrupted by frequent price changes so if the changes if the price is changing every day or every week it might it might backfire on the producer there's also of course an administration cost uh, the company has to change its database all its prices imagine in a supermarket having to change all the prices that's a big job and it's very expensive so price changing is not that easy um, there is also the possibility of getting advantage over rivals through what we call vertical integration. Vertical integration means the company uh, starts to sell directly to the consumer. It moves closer to the consumer. But it could also move backwards and control raw materials, or control production, or buy one of the component producers further back in the chain. And if it were to do that, then the competitors have got a problem. So if one company suddenly uh, vertically integrates, it's got the, let's say it's got the, the resources to do it, it could start selling directly to to customers or it could start to control the raw materials or the production or some component that's essential for the product or whatever it is. If we were to do that then the rivals may have a big problem on their hands. Um, another thing, way in which competition can happen is is by product differentiation. Um, an organisation differentiates itself from its competitors, and what it's doing really is trying to find something unique that the the buyers want. Um, differentiation leads to branding. It leads to identification of the product with the company. It's it's not generic. It's not common. Um, this also means of course that uh, differentiation is of two types. There's, there's a psychological differentiation. It may be through repetitive advertising that people come to believe that a certain product is better than its competitors. Um, petrol for example is petrol. Unleaded petrol, I, I guess for technical reasons, it must be more or less the same, it's homogeneous. But one retailer would like you to believe that their petrol is perhaps better than the next. And they do this by uh, producing advertisements which suggest that their petrol is 
is good. It's 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 excellent. You should only buy their petrol. Low levels of product differentiation um, leads to intense rivalry. If the products are almost the same, almost identical, then it doesn't matter to the consumer which one you buy. The only determining a factor in that case will be the price. So low levels of differentiation leads to very high um, levels of competition. There's also a problem with exit barriers. Um, companies can get locked in uh, to production. Perhaps a company has invested a lot in the premises and in very costly machines. But if the market now turns against the company the company can't get out. Well, it can't get out easily. Nobody wants to buy the specialist machines off them. There may be some second-hand market for those machines. So, high exit barriers means that a company may have to continue even though it's not covering all of its costs. But providing it's covering its variable cost, the cost of producing each item, then it's worth continuing. But it may not be covering what's known as the fixed cost, the cost of the, the capital and all of the sunk cost, all of the costs that are fixed in the buildings, in, in the premises, in, in the machines, in the offices and so on. But providing that each item, the cost of each item has been covered, it may continue to produce. So rivalry is influenced by a number of factors. These um, Here's a list of um, possible influences on rivalry. And we'll have a few words about each one of these in turn. Uh, let's start with the large number of organizations. Um, a large number of organizations uh, competing in a market will lead to each individual organization or each individual company struggling for market share. If there are only two companies in the market and if it was equally distributed, we have 50% each. It's very unlikely it would be equally distributed, but let's just pretend. But if there was a hundred companies in the market producing very similar goods, then perhaps uh, the company could expect on average one one percent of the the market share. That's a lot different. So, the number of organisations, the number of firms or companies in the in the market, really determines the degree of competition. The next one is slow market growth. Um, the problem is that organisations have to fight for market share. If if the market's growing very slowly and the companies want to grow and meet their corporate objectives and generate profits and invest and all this sort of thing, invest in, in new products and research and development and so on and so on. If they want to do that, the only way to do it is really to try and kill off the competitor by out-competing the competitor. So in slow market growth situations, companies become very competitive and try to become innovative in their competition to try and outmaneuver the competitors. High fixed costs, well if there are high fixed costs then perhaps the companies will have to produce in volume to try and meet uh, those high fixed costs, to try and cover the high fixed costs they have to produce in large volume sales. But if all of the companies in the industry produce high volume sales, perhaps the market is not there to absorb that. So again, high fixed costs can lead to rivalry, intense rivalry, but it can also lead to a great deal of frustration if the market is not expanding to meet that. High storage costs. Um, goods must be sold as soon as possible because they might be expensive to store. Depends on the nature of the product. Obviously if it's food stuff it has to be sold very quickly. Uh, so if it's perishable it must go quickly. But but if it's if it's large and bulky and 
it's taking up space, a lot of space, then space is money. Warehousing is, is money. Insurance and security and floor space. It's all expensive. So the idea is to, to try and get rid of the items in the market, through the market, as quickly as possible. But if all the competitors are trying to do it, again, price will be a bit down. Low switching cost. Um, if the consumers can switch between one product and the other very easily, in other words, if there's a very small degree of differentiation and if it's cheap to switch between one and the other, then rivalry will be intense. The, the companies need to try and keep the consumers, keep the existing ones and get new ones. It must win over uh, buyers who are currently going to rivals as well as keeping the existing ones. So if the switching costs are low then it's very difficult to do that. It's very difficult to keep the consumers. The consumers really don't mind who they buy from perhaps. It's a function of branding, it's a function of loyalty, it's a function of a lot of things but there certainly is an issue with uh, low switching costs. Um, low levels of product differentiation. Um, as I said earlier, differentiation can lead to effective branding. Differentiation means that you can identify the product with the producer. If there's no differentiation between the products, you can't tell really which producer is making it. You have to look at the label to try and find out who produced it. Now, if, if that's the case, if you have to look at the label, there's no differentiation. It doesn't matter which one you buy. But if you if the product is differentiated and if you uh, if you go out to buy the product and it looks different and it feels different and it acts differently and there are different conditions and so on and so on and then it becomes different in the consumer's mind, in your mind and perhaps the consumer or you or me or whoever wants to buy it will, will think this product is worthy of, of purchase, this is the one we want now differentiation, as I said earlier, can be of two types. It can be um, physical, looking at it, looking at the product. It looks different, it feels different, it has a different texture, a different design, a different colour, different components, different functionality. So it could be physical. Or the second way it can be differentiated is psychologically. It can be differentiated in the mind. We may imagine it to be different because a certain company in our minds, a certain company portrays a certain image. I suppose the the best example of this would be designer clothing. Um, if you buy uh, if you buy a t-shirt made by a top designer it'll cost more than a t-shirt made by whoever, nobody, by, by somebody across the road. Um, still a t-shirt the stitching might be different and it might be better by the designer and the fabric might be better still a t-shirt but in your mind it's a lot different um, however maybe I've got that wrong I don't know but it's still a t-shirt to me anyway let's think um, high exit barriers well as I said earlier companies may get locked into an industry uh, they can't get out because uh, they've got high costs, um, capital costs or premises or so on. In this case to fight vigorously to survive. So those are some of the, the points that lead to rivalry. Uh, and that's one of the one of the key functions, one of the key forces I should say, of Porter's Five Forces. Um, well worth deeper consideration this particular one. Okay, thank you for watching.